when it comes to working with compositions and actually animating those key or uh, setting the keyframes uh, that we talked about in the previous video, we start talking about the transformation values uh, of the layers. What can we do to a layer that will be considered a transformation? So the goal for this video is to try to recreate this very short animation, which is fairly simple. And you'll notice that basically it's a balloon going across the screen. It sort of swings with the wind and it rolls back out, but it goes so, sort of behind the mountains when it goes back out. So we're going to be create, recreating this animation. You will also notice that little stars are twinkling up at the top on the uh, um, top of the animation. So this is almost like a scene that you can extract from a children's book or something like that. So uh, we're going to be creating this animation in this video to showcase the transformation values. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. First thing I want to do is I want to import a, uh, the, a file that contains all of these layers that I have pre-created in Illustrator. The file in Illustrator contains every layer in its own separate layer. So if you want to take advantage of that while you're working in other programs such as Photoshop and Illustrator, instead of flattening the files into one single layer, you can take advantage of bringing everything in separate layers and you have the flexibility to either be, have it be interpreted as a flat image when you bring it in or have it as separate layers, which is what we're going to be doing right now. So let the first thing that we do is we go import and to import this, we could either use the file shortcut file import, or we can use control I or command I on the Mac. Now, this is the file that I want to import, which I had already imported before, as you can see here. But what I want to showcase is how can I import this file? When I import the file, I have two options. I can need three options, actually. I can either import it as footage, which means it's going to be flattened into a flat file. Even if it has 100 layers, it will just be considered one single layer. Or you can choose to import as composition retain layer sizes, which will respect the size of the artwork on each one of the layers, meaning if my, if my composition is 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, but the layer that I have is 50 by 50, that layer size will be 50 by 50. If there's another layer that is 200 by 300, that layer sizes will be 200 by 300. So every layer retains their own size. When you click composition, all of the layers will be sized to be the size of the composition. Now that doesn't mean that the program will distort your footage. What it will do, what it will do is it will create transparency that extends to the edges of the actual artboard, meaning all layers will be the size of the artboard. And so and we do this in case we are working with something for like a um, files for a, uh, uh, a Blu-ray uh, video or a Blu-ray uh, menu animation where we need things to match really well. This is where uh, having the ability to bring in all the, all the layers at the same size comes in handy because it allows you to uh, maintain that alignment seamlessly as you're working in after it when you're applying motion graphics so if i choose footage it will give me the option to say okay you say you want to bring it in flat but i don't know you might only want to bring one of the layers so if i click import it's going to tell me you might want to bring it in as footage but do you want to merge all the layers or do you want to choose from all the layers that are available in the file so that's the option with, with footage if you're bringing in an image, a PNG or a, or a TIFF file or something that is just one layer, you just bring it in as footage. You don't have to bring it in as layers. Let me cancel that and I'm going to bring it in as a composition retaining layer sizes. So when I go ahead and click import, it will create a new composition with the name of the, comp of the file that I brought in, as you can see. It will give me the dimensions and all the information up here and it will create a folder that contains all of the layers that were available inside that file as separate pieces of footage. The main thing here is that it create is that it creates an actual composition for you. So if you double click on the composition, you will open it up. You'll notice that it's called Mountains 2 because we already had an existing one which I had previously animated. This one comes in and it's just it looks like it's flat, but as I roll over each one of the elements on my composition, I notice that they are all layers within my composition down here within my timeline. So they it respected the size and the, the, the actual position within the hierarchy of the layers that I brought in from Illustrator. So it will maintain that. With that in mind, what I want to do now is I want to bring in my balloon layer. So I can go ahead and drop it into my, on the top of my composition, or I can simply drag it from here to the composition window if I want. Just drag that onto the timeline. And what I want to do is I want to animate this balloon moving across the screen till it gets to these two, uh, in between these two layers. 
And when it gets in between those two layers, it sort of swings back and it reduces, it scales down in size, and then it moves behind the mountains. That's what it does when we look at the animation that we saw earlier. Take a look. The balloon is sort of pushed by the wind. It sort of wiggles back and forth, and then it gets pulled back behind the mountains again by the wind, supposedly. So that is basically the animation that we are creating right now. So to do that, what I want to do is first things first. I want to move the anchor point because if you notice that the balloon is sort of swinging from the top of the balloon. However, if you notice my anchor point, which is basically the center of gravity of my layer, an anchor point is a property, by the way, that you can animate. Uh, that center of gravity is the point of reference from where anything that you do to a layer takes effect. Um, things such as scale, rotation, position, they all look at that point as the point of reference, the center of gravity for the layer. The, the only thing that doesn't look at that as a point of reference is your uh, temporal changes such as um, tra transparency. So in this case, we want to make sure that that anchor point is at the top, so that's where we want things to be swinging from. We want that. So how do we change this? Well, you have options when you want to work in uh, with the transformation values with the properties because real estate is at a premium. So if I open up the transformation values for that layer by uncollapsing the layer, you'll notice that I have a transform menu. If I click on transform, I have all of the different transformations that I can apply by default to that particular layer. They include anchor point, position, scale, rotation, and opacity. The shortcuts for each one of these are as follows. Anchor point, the letter A on your keyboard. Position, the letter P. Scale, letter S. Rotation, letter R. And opacity, letter T. T as in Tom, and that is because the opacity refers to tra transparency. However, transparency is some it's a different concept in this program. That's why they use the word opacity. But the shortcut is the letter T. So now, how do I how can I make use of those shortcuts? What what are they good for? Well, you notice that uncollapsing that layer basically bit off half of my timeline. So my real estate is getting short. So what I want to do is I want to collapse this again, and I want to start using those shortcuts to call the specific transformation values that I want to affect. So in this case, I want to start with position. So I'm going to press the P with the layer selected. I'm going to press P on the keyboard, and you'll notice that the position opens up. That is the transformation values for that position. So I am going to move my, my artwork to the right, and I'm going to press Shift to constrain the on the vertical, on the horizontal, sorry, as I am dragging it, and there it is. Then I am going to set a keyframe value for position at that point right there by pressing on the stopwatch, which is what we learned in the previous video. You'll notice that my diamond got activated on the left-hand side, and I have a little keyframe on my timeline. Then I'm going to, before I do anything else, sorry, I need to change, and I'm going to undo what I just did. I want to move my time, my anchor point to the top of that layer. That's the first thing I need to do. So I, to, in order to change the anchor point, I have two options. I can press the A key on the keyboard and use the numbers. So if I want to change the Y value, which is this is X value and this is Y. So for anything that has one, uh, two values, you're talking about X and Y. So things such as scale has X and Y, position has X and Y, and anchor point has X and Y. So if I want to change the anchor point on the vertical, which is the y-axis, I can use the numbers, but uh, the, the numbers that are given to me on this little window. But if I do that, you'll notice that I am actually moving the artwork. That's not what I want to do. I want to move the anchor point. For that, you would use this tool right here. That is the pan behind tool or the anchor point tool. So if I click on that tool, switch that tool to activate it, I now have access to moving my anchor point. If I want to constrain to the y-axis, as I am dragging, I'm going to long press the shift key so that it is constrained to the vertical only. And when I get to the point where I want to place it, I let go of my mouse, let go of my shift key, and there it is. The anchor point remains there. Now I can go ahead and call the position changes. So I'm going to select the layer on the timeline, press the P key on the keyboard, and start setting up my keyframes. So I'm going to go ahead and press the uh, time stopwatch to create my first keyframe. Then I'm going to go to about two and a half seconds on my timeline. I'm going to scrub down to about two and a half seconds. And then I'm going to place, I'm, I need to switch my tool back from the pan behind tool to the selection tool. So I'll press on the arrow. And then I'll move my artwork in between, to in between the mountains, which is where I wanted it to be. Then it's going to stay there for about 
one second. So from two, one, two and a half to three and a half is going to stay there. And at this point, I am going to create another keyframe with the same value of position because that's roughly the same position where it's going to stay. And then I'm going to go out in about two and a half seconds. So about actually, let's make it uh, all the way to six seconds. So right now, I'm going to just go ahead and click and drag my artwork to the left of the screen until it disappears off the side of the screen. And that creates my new keyframe. So I've already created the position keyframes by number one, pressing the original keyframe. Second, moving my artwork to the position where I needed it to be. Third, making a copy of that same keyframe. And fourth, moving it back out of the screen. So that is th that's, those are the position changes for that balloon. Now, uh, according to what we saw earlier, my balloon is supposed to be scaling down around here between two and a half and three seconds. That's where the scaling happens for that occurs for that balloon. So I need to go place my time marker around two and a half seconds. And now I want to call the scaling value to add keyframes to that particular property. Now I have options. If I have my layer selected, if I press the S key on the keyboard, it will switch my position for the scaling property. However, let's go back and press P again to call the position values. Uh, I want to use the keyframes for, for position that I've created as visual reference for the animation for scaling and for rotation. So I, how do I open two of those uh, properties at the same time? You can either go in and collapse as we did at the beginning, but you're going to run out, run out of real estate really fast. Or you could go ahead and press the, the shift key on the keyboard and then press the shortcut for the other value that you want to open, in this case, scale. So I'm pressing shift and then I'll press the S key and you'll notice that both of those transformations have been opened, which means I can now start animating on the scaling property. So if I go ahead and press the stopwatch with my time marker at two and a half seconds, I have created the first keyframe for scale. Then I go to three and a half seconds and I'm gonna reduce its size to about 75%, which is good. So I'm gonna basically the transformation happened from that point to that point, and that is it. You'll notice I only need two keyframes of transformation for that to create the effect that it's almost like it's being reduced in size because it's moving away towards the mountains. But you'll notice that it's still in front of the mountain, so we need to fix that in just a few. Now, to add to my effect, I want this balloon, balloon to give me that inertia feeling. So it's almost like there's friction and inertia. The inertia is it tends to stay put as it starts, meaning it's going to stay vertical, but as the wind pushes it, it sort of swings backward a little bit. So I want to do that by applying rotation. So with the same way that we apply, we opened up the scaling property, I'm going to select the layer and then I'm going to press the shift key and the R key on the keyboard. And that way I open up the rotation value for that particular layer. With that activated and with my time marker at the zero mark, I am going to activate the rotation keyframe ability for this particular layer with a rotation value of zero. But at one second, a one second of animation, I want this to be rotated about 15, frame, 15 degrees in this direction. So that it almost looks like as the wind starts pushing it, there's some sort of friction from the air that is forcing the balloon to go backwards like this. When it gets to stop at the 215 mark, I want it to start swinging in the other direction. But I want that to retain that value at that point still. So I want to make a copy of that last keyframe by clicking on the diamond right here on the rhombus shape and that the keyframe will be that keyframe will be the same value as the previous one. Then at around three seconds, I want this to swing in the other direction to about negative 15. If it is rotated positive 15 in this direction, it only follows that in the other direction, it will be about negative 15. So let's say negative 15 is going to rotate it in that direction. Maybe I want to make it negative 12 or negative 10 so that it's not too pronounced of a, of a pendulum motion. So it's sort of it, get, it gets that inertia because it stopped, but the balloon, the weight of the of this little thing at the bottom of the balloon of that um, basket is going to make it swing in that direction. And then it's going to swing back because of the momentum of the pendulum is going to go sort of rock back and forward. So at this point, I want it to go back again in the opposite direction. So I want it to go and I'm going to eyeball this one to about 10, 10 degrees. 10, positive 10 degrees. So it sort of goes like this and it swings back and forward a little bit. Boom, boom. And then at this point, as it starts being dragged in this direction, the friction of the air is going to push it back out, again, rotating towards the right-hand side. So in order to do so at around 415, I am going to make it go to negative 
15 degrees. Okay, or negative 14, something like that, negative 15. So if I want to enter a negative value here, I can highlight that number by clicking on it. And then I press the minus or the, the little dash on my keyboard and then 1.5 and hit return or enter. And that's how you enter that value for that. So you have now negative 15 and you can see that the air seems to be dragging it. Now let's play this back really quick to see what we've got so far. So the animation is getting there, but as you can see, the animation itself is very mechanical. I'm going to bring out my out point to the six second mark right here so that we can actually see this in action. And I keep on looping it, but the motion is very mechanical. So I need to define where I want things to happen. And since we're talking about inertia and friction, let's talk about those principles. Those are principles of animation as we saw in the first class. So um, if we're talking about friction and animation, things tend to be ten, things that are static tend to be static. But when you start creating motion, you have friction from whatever is holding it back. And so that means you start slowly, your animation starts slowly. So I want this rotation to be slowly taken off. And at the same time, I want the position to be slow as well. So to do that, I want to easy ease out these two keyframes. So I'll highlight those two keyframes, right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease out or control shift F9. So you'll notice that now it sort of starts accelerating slowly and it goes to, a, it gets to a point where the speed continues normally or at a steady pace. It starts slow and looks a little bit, it looks a little bit more natural. Now, when it gets here, notice that the stopping motion happens almost immediately as this starts swinging. So I want that position to be, um, I'm going to keep it as linear for now. But what I want to do is I want to ease these two things out, the scaling values. So I'm going to select the two keyframes for the scaling. Now, to select all of the keyframes in a property, all you need to do is click on the label for the property. So if I want to select all of the scaling value, all of the scaling keyframes, I'll click on the word scale. And you'll notice that all the keyframes get selected. If I clicked on position, all of the position keyframes got selected. In this case, I want to affect scale. So I'll click on the scale label and you'll notice that all of them got selected. If I right click, go to keyframe assistant, assistant and I go easy ease, that means everything in that layer will be accelerated and decelerated to make it look a little bit more natural in the motion. So let's play this back really quick and see what happens. Accelerates, boom. That's a little bit more natural. The motion is a little bit more natural. It's not perfect, but it's better than the mechanical thing we saw at the beginning. Now, what I want to do also is I want to make sure that this sort of takes off slowly from this keyframe here. So when it takes off in that direction, I want that motion to be easy is out. So remember, I mean, easy is in, sorry. So I can start, I'm going to be using from now on, I'm going to be using the shortcuts. So you'll notice that the shortcuts are F9 for ECEs, that means ECEs everything, in and out. ECEs in, just for when you're uh, coming into an animation, ECEs out as you're getting to another keyframe. So I am going to use Shift F9 to make the change to this one. So I can either use the shortcut, like I said, or start using the shortcut. So in this case, ECEs out actually is what I want to do. I want to showcase, I want to make sure that the out, the outgoing animation speed of playback going out of that keyframe is what's affected or slowed, uh, meaning accelerated, or basically that the interpolation changes. Remember, interpolation being the way that two keyframes talk to one another. So this frame now has interpolation changes saying, I am going to accelerate as I come up to speed to go towards the value of that keyframe. That's what interpolation is, the way the two keyframes talk to one another to define how the speed of change is going to be the rate of change between those two keyframes key will take place. So uh, we're going to change that one over here. Let's take a look at how this animation is looking now. So it rolls and that works a little bit better. However, I do see that there's a bit of a slack on this motion between the when the animation stops here and it starts rolling in that direction. I think that my balloon should already be rotated by the time it gets to about this point. That means that I need to move this keyframe upstream. So you'll notice that I'm going to define where I want it to go, which is about four seconds. So these things are malleable, meaning these keyframes I can move around on my timeline at my leisure to modify and basically what we call massaging the keyframes. 
massaging means you, you go into the animation, you set your keyframes, and by default, they're not going to be perfect. So you start going in and looking in detail to see where you want to enhance, slow down, accelerate, and so on, or change the position of keyframes in order to best tell the story, to best sell whatever it is that you're trying to animate. In this case, I want that keyframe rotation, which we place at 415, to happen at 4. And you'll notice that basically my item gets rotated already because then the rotation happens between those two keyframes. And as I can see this, that rotation looks a little bit more natural as if the balloon was being pushed by the wind, but the friction is holding it back in place. And that's exactly what I want that animation to look like. Let's play this back and take a look. So it rotates, swings, and now the animation is a little bit more natural. I perhaps want to bring it even further up. So there's no foul on not going exactly on the either the second mark or somewhere in between. I can just go ahead and move it up a couple of frames. Now, to see how many frames I want to move it up, I can zoom in by using the zoom bar like you would in Photoshop or by pressing the Alt key on the keyboard, keeping it pressed, long press it, and then use your middle mouse wheel on your mouse to zoom in to whatever you want to, to however much uh, magnification on the timeline you want to magnify. This dot does not change anything on your composition. You're simply zooming into the length of time to see whether you want to go all the way to frame where each one of these numbers indicates a frame within your timeline or all the way out to see the entirety of your timeline on however many seconds you have set up for that particular uh, timeline. So I want to zoom in onto this and I want to move it a couple of frames up. So I want to go to about 28 frames if I want to, uh, if I if I need to. So that's a little, and notice that it's only a two frame change, but it makes quite a difference in the actual visual. By the way, same thing applies to when this stops right here. When the balloon stops, it suddenly stops. I want it to already be rotating as it stops at this point. So I want to move back up about a couple of sec a couple of frames, and I want to move that upstream a couple of frames so that the balloon starts rotating. Now, that might be an insignificant difference in the amount of time that it changes, but it's just a slight difference that can sell, like I said before, the story to make it look a little bit more natural so that the rotation looks a little bit more seamless. And it's just a couple of frames. It doesn't have to be anything significant, nor do I have to create extra, extra keyframes, which is something that helps quite a bit. I'm also going to move this one up a little bit and see if that helps a bit on the animation. Look, the rotation looks a little bit more natural. It almost looks like it's actually swinging in the air, so that actually looks better. So this is time well spent. This is something that you do once you have set up all of your keyframes. You massage the keyframes to finesse the interpolation. Okay. Now that I have this set up and I have my animation complete, basically all I need to do is how do I move my balloon behind those mountains? As you notice, my balloon is at the very top of the stack of layers. So what I want to do is I want to move that layer somewhere to behind those layers, which happen to be down here. So how do I do that? Well, to do this, you, what you want to do is you want to do what we call split in a layer. Now, you select the layer that you want to split, and then you look for a point in time where things are not overlapping so that you can go ahead and create a split, a clean split, and then move the resulting extra layer behind the other layers or basically down on the stack. So to do so, I'm going to go ahead and select the layer and I'm going to go to edit split layer. Now, this is probably the last time you're going to see me doing this, this drop down menu for splitting layers up here because I usually sh use the shortcuts and you want to get you want to get used to using shortcuts in this program. It will make your workflow a lot faster. So if you do that, let's go ahead and split the layer and you'll notice that by doing that I split that layer whatever my time marker was that's where I want the, the layer to be split whatever time where I, I position my time marker where I want the split to happen and then I go ahead and go control shift D or command shift D on the Mac and that creates the split now that split layer basically retains all of the keyframes that this layer has let me go ahead and open up its rotation value position and scale and you'll notice that basically they both have the exact same keyframes and so that means is basically I just created a copy of the layer and I changed the in and out points of the layer which I will show you in the next class we're going to be talking about how to fine-tune layers so that we define in and out points for those layers that means for you that this footage will work and will be visible here 
And then after that point, the footage on this layer is invisible. I don't see anything else. And even though I have keyframes, I don't see anything in that layer. But at that point, I'm already seeing the other layer for, that, for which I created the split. And so it looks like it's seamless. As you can see, as I scrub my video around those, that split, you don't see any difference or anything being broken. So what I want to do now is I want to bring this layer down the stack to place it right uh, in front, right below this mountain here, which is this layer down here. So let me collapse the top layer really quick and actually collapse this layer here, the original. I want to grab the anchor, the, the, the actual icon of that layer, the, the copy, the split, and I want to start dragging it down all the way to behind the middle mountains right here, which is, these are the middle mountains right here. So that's where I want it to be. I want to go behind those mountains. So when I scrub my video, you'll notice that the video playback is the same, but now because my second layer, my split layer is behind the mountains or below the actual layers, you now see that the balloon appears to go back in space. So when I play this back by creating a preview, it seamlessly goes behind the mountains and it goes away. So this showcases the, the changes for uh, properties for anchor point, rotation, position, scale. The only thing that is left is the opacity, but by now you should have figured out that opacity works the same way. However, I'm going to show you how to work with opacity by making these stars at the top of my uh, composition twinkle. So what the way I'll do that is by selecting the first one of the stars, and you'll notice that when I roll over them, I get the little helper, the smart guides that the program comes with telling me you're over that piece of footage. So if I have one selected already and I press shift and I keep it pressed, long press shift, and then start clicking on the other layers, you have select them all. Okay, so if you selected them all like this, then you have, you have, them, all, you have them all ready to go. Now, they have been selected here. You can also select them by clicking on the names. And this is why I told you to use a naming convention that makes sense for you when you're creating your files. So that's the other option to select them. So you can either select on the composition window or you can select by clicking on the layers. Now with that done, what I wanna do is I wanna open up the opacity value for all four layers at the same time. Since I have them all selected, if I press the T as in Tom key on the keyboard, it calls the opacity value for those layers at the same time. If I change one with all of them, with all four of them selected, if I change one of them, they all will follow suit which means if I cl click on the stopwatch for opacity for the top star right here, for the right star, all of them will have a keyframe value of whatever the value was at this point. Then if I go, say, for example, to uh, the one second mark, or let me make it 15 frame mark, and I change the value of just the top one by clicking and dragging on the value here to make it zero, they all will disappear and they all will receive keyframes with that same value. I can now move to the one second mark and I'm going to make a, I'm going to drag a selection to select those two keyframes for that particular, for the top one, the top star layer, in this case. And I'm going to copy those two keyframes. So I'm going to press command or control C on the, on the keyboard. And then I'm going to paste them, control V or command V. And now I have basically what looks like a layer blinking over here, as you can see, because I already have that value committed to memory. For those two keyframes, I can now go ahead and shift select all these layers. And as I'm shift selecting them, I can press control V and the, val the values for that opacity were copied to all of these, uh, pasted on all those other layers. I can now then, by the same token, can select all of these layers by dragging a selection across all of them. Notice that I click outside of any of the keyframes and I drag a selection like marching ants on, on the, on photo in Photoshop. And I can select all of those keyframes, control C, and then I place my time marker on the uh, two second mark, select all of the layers by shift selecting them, press V, move to the four second mark, press V, control V, sorry, and so on and so forth. So I can go ahead and keep on adding keyframes as needed. And if you notice now, when I play this back, let me deselect all the layers by clicking on the gray area here on the pasteboard so that nothing is selected. Let's play this back and you'll notice that the little stars are twinkling the balloon is rotating and flying with friction, rotating and scaling, the anchor point has been moved and it is being positioned moving or moved around on the stage.
So this is how you access all of the properties for layers. Now, these are not the only properties you can affect. You can also apply keyframes to uh, effects. So when we start talking about effects, we, I will show you how to actually apply keyframes and they work the same way as they do here. You can move them on the timeline to uh, finesse the position, uh, the value changes and the speed of changes between keyframes and also to, um, you know, best fit the storyline that you're trying to tell, best fit uh, whatever you're trying to sell through your animation. That is uh, what we call massaging the keyframes. So once you set them up, you can go ahead and, and manipulate them to better fit the motion and make it look a little bit more natural or target whatever it is that you're trying to do with that animation.